here we go uh, very very good evening to all of you uh, welcome to design talk number 57 we have with us today uh, dr dinesh kathre uh, who passed from idc uh, in 1992 batch uh, visual communication uh, dinesh is currently a senior director and hod of uh, human centered design and computing group at uh, cdac pune and uh, this is the group that he also founded uh, and this group has been doing extensive work in the domain of uh, hci and dinesh himself has uh, pursued uh, a phd in hci in 2005 probably there were handful of those who have done that um dinesh has, has i mean three things that stand out in this whole thing is the fact that uh, dinesh has joined cdac immediately after uh, idc and have been with cdac all through um it means that he has he has found his entire career calling in an organization like that it says a lot about him and also about the organization um he also has pursued his uh, area which is which is what he is going to talk about um about the use of computing which is the big part of this whole uh, whole mission that he is into in in preserving heritage so the depth and the breadth of this entire subject was something that was very uh, interesting when i discussed with dinesh and i thought it's very very important for us to at least get a get an introduction to this subject and also understand the kind of complex set of uh, work that he is doing in that area including building tools which will help in uh, preserving our heritage in terms of documenting uh, be it physical be it digital so the kind of nuances that he brought into this whole subject was extremely extremely very interesting i thought it is it is very important for us to have him in this forum so on behalf of all of us first of all thank uh, dinesh for doing this for us um it's also very interesting that uh, he not only uh, uh, stayed in a in a career I and mean, created his own career in cdac but also i think is one of those uh, very exceptional uh, uh, people from the design community who actually uh, found a found a calling in use of high end technology and I, it means it's it's very tough for someone uh with a non tech background to be part of an organization which is only tech and uh, we know that cdac is uh, a pioneering uh, institution in supercomputing and i am very inspired by the fact that uh, somebody like vinesh was able to actually charter his entire career in a domain uh, of technology and also adapted his own uh, skills and and also his uh, aptitude and also his his design thinking and uh, found his found found a charter for himself is extremely very inspiring to look at so uh, i have given a write up about his uh, profile i mean which you can read up and uh, there is the fact that he has been in this domain for so long i mean there is testimony to that is the kind of awards that he has won the several awards he has won he has uh, been in the industry in the heritage industry working with Uh, international organizations and also uh, contributed very very uh, very very focused and focused manner um, so this certainly something that we should look at because his profile uh, in cdac also talks a lot about the work that he has done i urge all of you to take a look at it uh, whenever whenever you get time to do that and before i hand over the session to dinesh i just want to also Uh, let the audience know that apart from what he does he is also a trained classical hindustani singer and uh, he along is along with his son uh, see releases a series of videos uh, which link i have given in this profile also please do take some time to look at it it's very beautifully rendered and uh, with that introduction it's all over to dinesh uh, it's all yours thank you Uh, thank you uh, ravi um, and nimish and uh, all the volunteers who are uh, actively organizing this uh, series of series of lectures for the idc alumni 
so uh, I'm very grateful to everyone who has joined in the late evening uh, after the uh, uh, office work. Uh, I'm sure uh, my presentation will be exciting enough for you to be remain engaged. Uh, so today I am going to speak uh, uh, on the aspirational goal of digital eternity, innovating a future for the past. That's the title that I have chosen. So in all my uh, presentations, I like to take a new perspective and uh, uh, relook at my ongoing work and what more can be explored, what more can be done. Uh, so uh, in the same way, I have uh, taken a slightly uh, different perspective. Uh, and through that, I'm going to present uh, my um, work in the domain of computing for cultural heritage, you know, almost for past 30 years. Uh, without any deviation, uh, we have been working with one goal and one mission, uh, uh, and that is focused on the Indian heritage and using various technologies for its preservation, uh, popularization, dissemination, and uh, all possible things that we can do with the technology for the Indian heritage. So um, um, uh, when I joined uh, CDAC in 92, you know, uh, I mean, my uh, first introduction uh, with Dr. Bhatkar, I mean, he mentioned to me that we are getting into multimedia, you know, that was the a new technology which was on the horizon and uh, uh, and he said that we need, need someone like you to be part of the team you know so that's where i joined cdac but as you know cdac is mainly into developing technologies in the field of ict and electronics and building supercomputers and things like that so um, i needed a, a a niche you know a subject which will also bring in the design innovation and I can also contribute to the technology. So I chose uh, cultural heritage as the primary focus you know, for my work. And uh, without knowing the vastness of the cultural heritage, you know, what challenges I will face. So uh, it was uh, at the spur of moment, you know, I, I got into the domain of cultural heritage, which involved multimedia computing and design both together. Uh, so um, if we if I look back, you know, my journey has evolved into four distinct phases, you know, and roughly they are about uh, separated by uh, 10 years, you know, so decades Four, uh, I mean, I can say so it started with multimedia computing, wherein the focus was more on the multimedia and the subject was cultural heritage. So in the year 2000, I had realized that cultural heritage should be the primary focus and all possible technologies uh, should be utilized for, uh, for its promotion, popularization, preservation and conservation, whatever that can be uh, done for the cultural heritage should be utilized. So it, it changed to the technology. And then uh, around uh, uh, in 2010, um, I got introduced to, to the fact that uh, all the digital information that we are generating is subjected to obsolescence because of the changing technologies and a vast amount of digital heritage that we are generating, our civilization is generating, is uh, threatened by this uh, threat of uh, by by the obsolescence of. Uh, the, te the technologies and devices and the tools that we produce. So digital preservation uh, is the theme uh, that uh, started uh, in that uh, period. And in 2020, when we have built uh, the massive digital repositories, I find myself myself in the domain of big data. And uh, also the immersive reality, virtual reality has caught up. Uh, alongside and um, so we are trying to uh, create the immersive worlds for uh, reliving the uh, ancient lifestyle and the uh, the glory of uh, the ancient past that is there so these are the broad four phases through which the journey has really evolved so i'm going to first focus on uh, innovating a future for the real world heritage you know the that is the 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 physical world or 
the physical uh, heritage that we have around us so uh, to to first i mean uh, before i go into discussing the details let me first understand what we mean by the past you know so uh, from an individual perspective um, if we look at the the functioning of our brain you know what we are constantly engaged in uh, is essentially the sensing and thinking these are the two activities that we that we are doing so sensing is is mainly through the sense organs wherein the data is collected and it is processed and whichever memories that are uh, worth preserving or worth retaining they go into the long term memory i mean this is a common understanding that we have the the short term memory is for the uh, the operational purpose which we which we use and we forget so um, our long term memory is essential the personal uh, archive or a personal repository that we have it's a personal repository of the memories and these memories are uh, not just stored as uh, the independent files uh, or independent uh, uh, images and uh, you know they are not disconnected they are all connected so the uh, the associations and the semantic linkages and the references uh, everything it gets connected everything that we see everything that we sense uh, is memorized and it gets connected with the rest of the memories and uh, our overall knowledge that we have acquired so that is from the personal perspective but when we look at the civilizational memory uh, what we see is that it gets reflected in the form of manuscripts books cultural heritage traditions archaeological um, uh, uh, artifacts monuments records and so on and it also includes the digital data that we are producing so uh, so just as we have to preserve the personal memory we also have to preserve the civilizational memory so um, uh, uh, if we look at the 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 overall scope of heritage you know if there is a new science which is getting evolved which is called as heritage science so in that context i had prepared this uh, particular figure so we have lost heritage that is one category in which india in, in the indian context you have uh, the sindhu civilization saraswati river and dwaraka and perhaps uh, even ramayana and mahabharat uh, are also part of the lost heritage then you have living heritage wherein you have the tribes and uh, events and festivals and rituals and things like that in some countries even the artists and scholars when they are alive they are declared as the national heritage you know so we don't have that practice but you also have this uh, the living heritage which is around you and that requires to be um, uh, preserved then you have tangible heritage which includes the uh, movable antiquities and uh, the monuments which are immovable and in the non digital uh, the non tangible heritage you have oral traditions the knowledge which is in practice uh, the dance forms music folklore and things like that now what is happening is that with the uh, advent of digital technologies all the aspects of heritage are getting converted into the okay. digital uh, into the digital form we are building we are digitizing them we are developing applications uh, which can give information uh, we are developing applications for search and retrieval uh, over the uh, repositories of the heritage and so on and there are many things which are happening but everything is Bigger. coming into the digital domain so uh, this is the kind of uh, scope that we have you know recently um, uh, before the uh, i'm actually a member of the scientific advisory committee for the science and heritage research initiative shri you know program of uh, department of science and technology and uh, so for this committee i have actually prepared this uh, scope for uh, the uh, heritage science initiative and uh, if you see all the aspects of uh, indian heritage starting from the prehistoric period to the modern in india and from the sand clock to the electronic age you know that has been the span uh, of uh, the evolution and uh, if you look at the various aspects it, it includes all kinds of things uh, the flora fauna even the environment is also our heritage you know you have archaeological sites forts and 
uh, Vedas and uh, uh, the Vedangas and arts and crafts and tribal medicine, everything. I mean, you have all kinds of you have even the 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 uh, the culinary uh, practices. The uh, just a moment. So, um, so wide variety of things are there as part of the Indian heritage. And what we see is that everything is linked with every, everything. So, um, however, we, we see the uh, various aspects of heritage uh, not so much linked or, uh, um, uh, you know, the relations are yet to be established. It is primarily because of the lack of knowledge and uh, you know the scholars need to do more work to find the relations and linkages between these various uh, aspects of the uh, uh, heritage so i'll not discuss the heritage sciences uh, at the moment but this gives you the scope of the indian heritage so when we look at this uh, you realize that it is a task of uh, several lifetimes you know one lifetime is not sufficient to even do justice to one of the aspects you know it is that uh, vast activity and uh, one can really dedicate uh, you know the entire life uh, for uh, 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 working on the the indian heritage you know so um, when we started you know uh, the the most important thing that happened is the uh, i i got a project to establish the national multimedia resource center which not only gave us the funding but also uh, the freedom to take up uh, uh, our own uh, you know uh, initiatives for developing heritage uh, uh, products and tools just one and second, uh, just one second Dinesh. yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, could you go mute actually we are getting some sorry sorry yeah so shall i start yeah okay so uh, 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 I will not be really discussing each of the uh, milestones here, but the most notable ones I will definitely touch upon. Uh, we uh, the, the first project was uh, the to develop the uh, CD-ROMs on uh, Jnaneshwari, a multimedia rendering of Jnaneshwari. Uh, so this was uh, a massive project, you know, and uh, we also did the visualization of the metaphors in Jnaneshwari, we created animations. And this was a completely interactive uh, software uh, for uh, uh, you know, listening to the uh, recitation of the verses. And uh, uh, you know, you could turn the pages and get the recitation. You could, you can also under, you could also understand the meanings of the difficult words. And the as per the metaphors, we had even done the the structuring of uh, the shlokas and OVs. Uh, so this was actually a very massive project. And for this purpose, we did the recording of the recitation of Nyaneshwari, which went on for almost uh, six or seven months in a professional studio and we produced hundreds of hours of audio recording and which had to be edited and the the prevailing audio editing tools that were available i realized that they were not sufficient to deal with such voluminous and long length of audio recitation now if we if we look at the recitation of the vedas or upanishads i mean you have they run for very long duration and you require an editing tool which captures the characteristics of the verses and um, and we so we re i realized that the uh, the available tools were not sufficient so we developed our own audio editing tool slice it you know so as uh, one uh, uh, was listening to the uh, the uh, the audio rendition rendition of nyaneshwari one could uh, simply press a few keys and uh, and uh, place the markers you know the start point and the end point of the verse and uh, you would have uh, finally uh, done the marking for say 200 verses and you could slice them into in, uh, separate audio files with proper naming conventions. So this was uh, uh, an innovative tool that we developed and we used it for the project. Also a multimedia authoring tool, you know, uh, uh, we developed and uh, we also productized it. Uh, of course, we could not really reach the market, but this was 
uh, the experience which taught me the product management skills you know how to conceptualize it build it uh, uh, build the installable do the testing come up with a user manual do the product packaging everything you know so this was my initial uh, experience and upbringing into developing a software product uh, then we worked on this life and work of uh, Srinivas Ramanujan the mathematical genius this was a very interesting uh, set of CD-ROMs that we developed for the science popularization division of Department of Science and Technology and uh, in year 2000 we organized uh, this multimedia technology for culture this was the first conference uh, which focused on using multimedia technology for cultural heritage and i had invited uh, n gopala swami who was the secretary of ministry of culture at that time and he went on to become uh, basically the chief uh, election commissioner of india thereafter so uh, when i met him he told me that uh, uh, that we have uh, so many national museums uh, but we don't know what we are uh, having in our position you know so he said he expressed the, his requirement uh, in his own words that he said we need a kind of uh, compendium you know national compendium of all the antiquities can you uh, come up with some technological solution for us and so this is the diagram which you see on the left hand side in 2001 so this is the kind of uh, vision that uh, i articulated and i came up with a proposal you know wherein we first uh, mentioned about the e curator software and we will have a uh, virtual museum web server and there will be a national repository of all the collections of uh, the national museums and how it will benefit the schools and how the several museums will be able to participate uh, in such a scheme and when i submitted this proposal he was transferred you know so this proposal was lying there dormant for many years thereafter but uh, the momentum that we got from this uh, idea and the vision we developed the first version of jatan virtual museum builder it's a digital collection management for the museums so the first version got developed in 2004 yeah, as you can see i also conceptualized and uh, made a presentation in one of the conferences on the collaborative metadata enrichment because in the museums they have antiquities from various eras and various uh, you know periods of history but they don't have all the expertise available with them to be able to describe those objects you know so they so uh, 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 this is the kind of vision i developed uh, wherein the the subject experts from all over the world will be able to contribute uh, using the Jatan software and they will collectively, collaboratively enrich the metadata. So it, it was actually the first vision of uh, crowdsourcing. You know, today we call it crowdsourcing. But in, in 2005, I called it as collaborative metadata enrichment. So uh, thereafter, uh, another innovative uh, initiative uh, that was uh, taken to, uh, and that was of 3D reconstruction of the courtyard of Qutub Minar, you know. So um, during my visits to Delhi, I uh, visited Qutub Minar several times and I saw the, uh, the, the broken arches of the courtyard, you know. And uh, uh, even though I am not an architect, I was in a position to visualize if those arches were uh, uh you know reconstructed i mean you could easily connect them uh, together and you can visualize how uh, how the structure would really look like so using the 3d modeling technique uh, uh, we uh, we created a 3d reconstruction of the courtyard of Qutub Minar. And also, uh, as you can see in 2007, we developed a tool for the museum conservators, you know, wherein they have to apply various chemical treatments for uh, 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 fixing the damages uh, of the antiquities uh, and they can do the cost estimation and they can also capture the photographs of the damaged portions using this pocket PC based uh, conservation tool that, uh, that time we didn't have really mobile phones but handheld devices is what we used to call this was very much ahead of in time i mean so this this tool uh, never got used in the museums uh, but we developed it uh, uh, so the coming back to the uh, kutub minar experiment you know uh, i also happened to see that there is a um, there is a only 
ground floor of the Alai Minar, you know. So this was built by the Alauddin Ala Kilji, uh, who uh, was very ambitious and he thought he will build a minar which will be double in height, you know, as compared to uh, Kutub Minar. So, uh, but uh, he built the uh, first floor and he died, you know. So uh, the, that the Alai Minar is an incomplete work. So uh, this is an example where, uh, you know, I have also visualized if the Alai Minar was also constructed, um, uh, how tall it would be, you know, as compared to Kutub Minar. So such using the early satellite images that were available, this was uh, uh, done on the uh, the the satellite images that was available. So uh, how we could visualize the ruined architectures and uh, uh, and and re recreate the world you know which existed around that time. So this was an early experiment of that. So um, uh, after the 2009 onwards, you know what happened is uh, the stream of the physical heritage, you know, real world heritage was also catching pace wherein our work started getting recognition uh, uh, from the uh, ministry of culture or even the at the unesco level uh, it started getting noted uh, and around the same time the digital preservation thread also began so i'll just quickly touch upon this the uh, so in 2012 the ministry of culture decided to standardize the jatan uh, virtual museum builder for all the national museums 10 national museums and subsequently i also gave a proposal to build the national digital repository for the museums of india so uh, this was envisioned uh, you know in 2001 but the the dream actually got, uh, got uh, act, uh, you know it became reality in 2014 wherein we we set up the portal and wherein the data from 10 national museums started coming to, to this digital repository which is set up at cdac so uh, uh, on the digital preservation front the ministry of information technology involved me uh, to develop this area because the uh, IT ministry was investing thousands of crores in uh, computerization and electronic governance. So the uh, how to preserve the electronic records is a big challenge, you know, like, for example, your birth certificate, you know, which you produced in the paper format, it is still, still there with you, you know, for last 50 years or 70 years. Yeah, the, that it, it may be a crumpled uh, paper, but it is still there in your file. But now through e-governance, we are producing the electronic records. The birth certificate is given in the digital form with a digital signature. So such bond digital document, will it survive next 50 years? How, and will it be uh, admissible in the court of law as a legal document? So that was the question which the uh, the ministry was uh, confronting with, and they thought that I should be the resource person for the for evolving this uh, digital preservation area. So it started because in the U.S. this was recognized; uh, all, they were 10, 10 years ahead of us. So uh, I decided to collaborate with uh, Professor Joseph Jaja from University of Maryland. And we both together basically organized this uh, Indo-US workshop on digital preservation. And I could bring almost 20 experts from uh, the Library of Congress and, uh, and all over the, uh, I mean, some of the universities, the professors and the technologists who were working on the digital preservation theme. And uh, thereafter, you know, uh, uh, as required by the ministry, as a sponsored project, I came up with the national study report on uh, the, the digital preservation requirements of India, wherein uh, I could get almost 30 uh, domain experts from various organizations. It included uh, basically science, technology, uh, UID, e, uh, you have, we had DRDO, ISRO, uh, cultural heritage institutions, film archives, uh, insurance, finance, all the uh, uh, diverse domains. And we we basically try to define the um, current state of the digital uh, assets available in these organizations. And we must know what is at stake, you know, if we were to take up this program. So what will be the R&D component? What should be the roadmap? What tools, technology should be developed, you know? And uh, how, how can this be implemented in India? So with that, I started and then uh, subsequently, the Center of Excellence for Digital Preservation got established 
uh, at sea that pune i i my project got uh, sanctioned and uh, so through this uh, many initiatives uh, many technologies got developed uh, around same time the unesco also invited me to be to become a part of the expert committee which drafted the standard setting instrument on preserving uh, in the digital era so um, so by, by this basically all the member countries are required to make the public policies for uh, preserving the digital information as part of the basic human right you know because now what is the digital preservation thing you know i am going to come to that uh, so you will see that um, so um, uh, so this is the the museums of india thing uh, uh, so as you can see from the 10 national museums which which are connected uh, with the, the the centralized national digital repository which we have set up at cdac so all the digital collections uh, come to us and they are made available from the museums of india uh, portal so uh, so this is basically providing a virtual unified catalog of all the antiquities now uh, prior to this you know uh, each museum had say 10 objects of harappan gallery 10 or 15 or 20 so and they are geographically separated so you could never get uh, access to all the collection in one place it was not possible so virtually it is uh, now possible and this initiative has also been uh, there are uh, full chapters uh, published in some international books on how this project was implemented by us uh, in comparison with the canadian uh, uh, heritage network or the europeana which was also a similar kind of initiative implemented in europe and uh, and uh, we have, we were not uh, following the any of the developed countries we were on par with them we developed it along with them as they developed european at the, around similar time we developed this entire museums of india you know the digitization and uh, uh, which provides uh, search and retrieval and many innovative things that uh, we have created for this so now we come to the digital world heritage. Uh, so uh, uh, if you um, uh, recall all the ancient knowledge encoding methods in terms of the uh, cave paintings or papyrus or stone inscriptions, uh, palm leaves, you know, um, or the manuscripts. So all these uh, knowledge encoding um, media have survived for thousands of years you know even today we have the stone inscriptions we might have lost the knowledge of the scripts or the languages that are used there uh, but uh, but the basic stone slab with all the inscription is still available with us you know so that's the beauty of the physical uh, uh, knowledge encoding media but what is happening with the modern knowledge encoding uh, methods that we have which are mainly technological so i have tried to take a snapshot of everything that is there so if we uh, um, carefully see the storage devices the computer the cpu computer hardware the operating systems software tools file formats everything is becoming obsolete in a short span of five to ten years you know uh, mobile phones are getting obsolete within three years you know so um, you may not be able to read the read or retrieve the the files generated using some old device that you had you may not even be able to charge it because even the connectors are changing you may not be able to uh, find a suitable connecting interface for for a mobile phone which existed some 10 years back or the if we look at the floppy drives uh the punch cards i mean they they have gone long long back and they have gone along with the data that was stored on these devices so um winton surf who, who is regarded as the father of internet uh, uh he also is is one of the digital preservation evangelists and and uh, along with many scholars he also joins in calling the 21st century as the digital dark age uh, just as we had the the jurassic uh, uh, period you know that was a dark age we don't know why the the, the dinosaurs vanished so they just vanished uh, so similarly uh, our present day civilization uh, is also uh, somewhat uh, similar the digital footprint that we are creating we don't know what is vanishing in the physical world at least the broken pillar or a stone slab will be lying there you know for the next hundred years but in the digital domain 
if something vanishes there is no trace left behind you know so we live, live in such a fragile times you know wherein all the knowledge and information and the the beautiful uh, things that we create uh, you know the blogs that we are writing which are equivalent to the cave paintings uh, you know uh, some 4000 years ago we don't know whether that will survive next 50 even 50 years is very far uh, far off you know for next 10 years you know so that's the challenge that we are facing so um, uh, so as per this uh, there is this digital age uh, 2025 report by uh, idc this is uh, international data Cons consortium so as per their estimate these the overall estimated size of the digital universe in 2025 will be 175 zettabytes you know so this is so one zettabyte equals to a billion uh, terabytes or something like that it's massive size we are, and uh, we are creating these digital universes in terms of the scientific data mobile data cultural heritage data you have digital india you the audio data now just imagine uh, i'm just citing an example of ar rahman i mean such a historic musician he and he is a digital musician what will happen to the digital files the music files that he is creating you know will they be readable after 10 15 years 20 years uh, the music created by some of the gurus, you know, at least their notations, some of the things are available, uh, you know, because they are in physical medium. But what will happen to the digital files, the, the digital uh, music data that is getting created? So will it be available 50 years from now or 100 years from now for the future generation? So that is the question. So that is where the this netpreserve.org, you know, that is one... Uh, uh, community the uh, internet preservation community that is there so which is uh, uh, working and debating on how we could uh, preserve the in information that is getting published on the internet now if we were to take a snapshot of, of one second you know uh, of everything that is there on the internet uh, uh, we don't know what is the size and what is the kind of uh, storage and how we are going to really manage such uh, enormous volume of data and how we are going to search retrieve analyze and make sense of that because every day billions of new pages are getting created and the same number of pages are vanishing you know we don't know what is going away from the internet so that's the uh, and why it is critical because that is a civilizational footprint that we have and it is changing every moment so that is the magnitude of challenge so in this particular context the as per the state of the art you know what we have is uh, there are a number of standards but the umbrella standard is called as uh, iso 16363 the uh, trustworthy digital repository you know how to uh, basically it has to be audited and certified year after year by a third party and uh, such a digital repository which is uh, used for long term preservation it has to comply with uh, various uh, things you know such as uh, the it has to have a, a policy and uh, you should have data repurposing and value creation so how innovatively you can use the data that is preserved in the repository uh, risk management uh, the kind of infrastructure that you may have or the kind of standards and best practices that you follow the archival systems and many tools you know that are required for preservation uh, so uh, all those things have to be brought in together uh, to be able to get the certification so uh, i'm very happy to um, uh, note here that in 2017 we set up a digital repository and that was world's first repository to complete all the compliances and we could get the iso 16363 certification and for doing this uh, setting up this repository you know uh, i had to also introduce this standard uh, uh with the national Accredita accreditation board uh that is there uh, the quality council of india uh, create awareness among them and uh, this standard was introduced and uh, uh, we we got the, uh, all the we so we had to also set up the repository develop the tools train the 
staff you know and uh, do everything that was essential to come uh, over here so uh, so we have developed a number of tools you know as you can see here uh, the e prolet digitale that is electronic records management sanskruti digitale that is uh, e library and archival system uh, then extraction data data antar e rupantar e sangrahan data hastantar uh, meta parivartan suchi samaykan digital mudra maha data antar that is on the cloud you know how we we can uh, process and ingest large volumes of data so um, all these tools have been developed uh, by my team and uh, we use them for setting up of such uh, digital repositories uh, so with this you know when um, uh, we started dealing with massive volumes of data we naturally uh, found ourselves in the big data analytics domain wherein we have uh, we are doing number of uh, uh, r and d uh, you know uh, into developing tools uh you know the, and they are using artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, for the purpose of uh, automatic metadata extraction automatic tagging of table of contents for a digital library you have scanned books but the the tocs are not hyperlinked with the uh, the the chapter pages so how we can automatically do the tagging the automatic classification of the records so if you have mous tenders uh you know all kinds of uh, correspondences and so many things uh, we have developed a tool which can automatically classify everything you know uh, and put them in se separate folders document orientation detection so uh, and these uh, tools have been developed based based on many interesting insights uh, uh, you know so visual entity recognition for the miniature paintings wherein uh, you want to identify the king and the soldiers and the princess and the uh, various animals and there are many things happening you know so can we uh, generate the scene descriptions automatically so we are uh, exploring some of these things for the uh, the repository of miniature paintings that has got created in the museums of india then uh, uh, developing ontologies and knowledge classification tools uh, for semantic search and retrieval so this is another uh, uh, experiment so uh, so there are many interesting things going on here in the analytics domain so um, uh, uh, the, uh, so as you can see here the 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 first uh, iso 16363 repository includes basically uh, 30000 hours of audio and video data uh, uh, almost two petabytes uh, of storage it's a really massive uh, work we have set up digital libraries and we then uh, uh, around 2019 we also entered into the internet of heritage things wherein uh, we have created an uh, iot team which is uh, experimenting with sensors uh, and how we could bring interactivity uh, and how sensors could be used for uh, conservation purpose uh, and so on uh, on if we have also come into the augmented and virtual reality uh, as you can see here we have created a 3d virtual avatar of dr ambedkar wherein he he delivers uh, uh, this the historic speech that he del uh, uh, from the constituent assembly you know we have just the audio recording so so the virtual avatar actually lip syncs with the audio and this has been set up in the symbiosis museum um, uh, uh, so we, we have also developed ai based uh, uh, 3d virtual avatars of the famous scientist you know like dr vikram sarabhai wherein uh, we have integrated speech recognition and text to speech wherein uh, he can uh, basically uh, lip sync with the questions that you have typed and uh, if you answer the questions uh, uh, the they are rec speech recognition is used for uh, uh, knowing what has been answered and depending on that he responds back and uh, and a complete dynamic animation that happens before you so um, so uh, coming back to the uh, the the digital eternity you know so digital is so fragile you know so um, what should be done so that it will be preserved for uh, at least for a lifetime of eternity we can say at least if i am creating my data it should, at least it should survive for my lifetime you know if we look at the uh, the idc days you know 
we created animation films on uh, we and stored them on vhs tapes now vhs is an obsolete medium you will not even find a vcr anywhere to play it you know so we uh, so we, uh, if we created some cad files 3d models industrial design products i mean you you use digital tools and uh, how will you really carry forward your portfolio you know as you progress uh, with your career uh, is really questionable so what must happen is basically we so this is some what i feel you know based on my experience is we must have universal intelligible file formats you know which are self describing and it should also support the knowledge markup uh, and it should be self sufficient with the properties for searchability discoverability semantic linkability and so on i also backward and forward compatibility is something so somewhere the iso and the united united nations also has to pitch into this to make sure that we have these uniformats you know which are open source and if you want to preserve something for next 100 years you better store it in these uniformats and not in the proprietary file formats you know so that must happen the second thing which i find i mean i always refer back to the the brain uh, how the function brain functions you know so how we actually manage our memories is basically we are always repurposing them you know we so there must be something so uh, the artificial intelligence field should really come up with some uh, artificial information repurposing tools for uh, so that the if the information is used in different contexts if if the extrapolation happens if uh, if it gets uh, repurposed in different shapes and forms in different contexts then i'm sure it will get preserved you know because uh, if we look at the human evolution itself we we lost the tail because primarily because uh, it, uh, it, uh, it was not useful to us anymore so keeping the information in a useful way it has to be useful in different contexts so can we have these uh, the uh, the artificial information repurposing is something which must happen and the large uh, digital repositories you know we have to build non knowledge services so this is actually a very uh, innovative and very creative area wherein how knowledge could be extracted now we we set up digital libraries now there are tens and thousands of books there but uh, uh unless you open the book you won't know anything uh, that is contained there you know so so much knowledge is there but we don't have access to it all we have is search and retrieval that's that's the least that one can have i mean but that's not really that's the minimum i mean we have to we definitely deserve much more so the uh, the other uh, notable international projects include you know uh, uh, these are already uh, granted i mean people are experimenting one is virtual immortality wherein they they talk of digitizing people you know so uh, creating live avatars of people which will behave and react uh, uh, in the same, same way as the living person did you know wherein uh, uh, they talk of uh, uh, the mind files and doing semantic analysis of the social internet use and using artificial intelligence for creating these immortal avatar immortalized avatars of individuals so that is one uh, notable project which is somewhat aiming towards the kind of digital eternity that i am talking about also there, there has been an experiment on uh, storing uh, the digital information on dna so uh, as you as you know the dna can survive uh, thousands of years and people are still digging the skeletons and bones and they are able to recover a dna and uh, study uh, uh, study the code <laughs> With, uh, it, they can try to decode it so dna can survive without any maintenance it can survive for a very long time so people have tried to um, uh, sequence the convert the binary data into the dna sequence you know uh, and uh, they have synthesized these strands of dna and they are able to encode it back so that's also another uh, interesting initiative that we have so with this uh, i uh, conclude my presentation uh, so actually uh, i am supported by a large team at cdac so i would like to thank them as well as uh, i also thank all uh, all of you for uh, giving your precious time for this presentation thank you very much thanks dinesh uh, uh,
without taking uh, any more time, I just open this forum for questions. We have just about 10 minutes. Uh, those who want uh, to raise a question, please uh, click on the hand icon so that I will know. Who is going first? Yeah, go ahead, Sunil. Uh, hi, Dinesh. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I just wanted to uh, come from a commercial angle. Uh, is it just a national interest that uh, people are showing, or can there be? Can we look at like uh, what could be the commercial value of uh, these digital uh, museums and uh, things? Uh, there is a lot of uh, commercial value uh, in this uh, because there are many private museums which are coming up. Uh, uh, and many private museums have approached us for uh, even using the Jatan software and the private collections are there and uh, private archives are there and uh, most importantly all that is digital you know uh, will you, sooner or later will require your attention for its preservation and uh, so uh, the trusted digital repositories that I have talked about they are basically like a bank you know so you can't uh, manage all your money, uh, uh, you, you know, yourself. You can't keep it in cupboards or lockers, you know. Yeah, yeah. Give it to a bank which manages uh, manages on your behalf. So um, very soon we will have trusted digital repositories which, which will offer such services. So whatever valuable digital assets that you may have, you may give it to them for uh, preservation and they will... Uh, they will uh, sign an agreement with you saying that we will uh, retrieve this data and give it back to you 20 years or 25 years or even 50 years later you know so um, uh, so that is the kind of future which will uh, emerge you know where we will have these uh, trusted digital repositories and they will be like uh, digital banks you know we, which will manage your data on your behalf got it thank you so there is a lot of co commercial value here. Right? Mm -hmm. And just to add, I think uh, the fact that there are so many tools being built and so many uh, technologies that have been discovered or invented in this process, they by themselves have become byproducts which have their value also. I mean, for example, if you are doing a way of uh, creating an AI methodology for capturing something for an image archive. That itself probably is a tool which has got you know applications beyond this. So probably it's not just about archive, but there are other tools which you are developing. And also coming back to the cultural heritage, you know, the entire tourism industry, which is uh, a commercial industry, you know. So the tourism industry has to take initiative uh, in building uh, these kind of uh, innovative applications for the heritage, you know. So we have actually uh, tried something to uh, build a uh, toolkit uh, with uh, mobile apps and content creation apps wherein the the uh, the private uh, you know the tourism uh, companies will be able to build applications for the heritage monuments you know because we have now if you take pune city we have hundreds of monuments which no, no one agency will be able to do justice to them so it has to be open to uh, the uh, all the players in the market and they should be able to uh, you know uh, um, not only uh, contribute uh, in the preservation of heritage, but also extract benefits for their own businesses. We have two questions coming. Uh, one is from uh, Venkat, and following Venkat, it will be uh, Sanjay. Venkat, go ahead. Yeah, Katre, wonderful presentation. Uh, as was always, uh, thank you very much for doing it. Um, I uh, My question is related to the two aspects that I see coming through in your presentation. One is this very hardcore uh, you know, technology and organization information design kind of work where you talk about you know, uh, how it is about information science, classification, ontologies, uh, metadata, describing you know, tools that describe uh, automatically say a miniature painting and then you know extract information from it and all those kinds of very exciting work happening on the one side and yet there is this public facing side right where you know which also talks about the uh, the usefulness of this information so what is the point of all this heritage wonderfully captured and stored in some format 
if people cannot enjoy it or use it right so correct, and correct. That, that is one of the ways by which you can sustain an Absolutely. effort like this right Absolutely. so you you make it useful and you gave the very nice analogy of how memory right Where memories uh, re, we retain memories because we reuse them repurpose them right so uh, and then the effort on that is the second aspect of your work that i saw where for example you talked about dr ambedkar's uh, 3d avatar which uh, lip syncs with the actual speech uh, uh, get delivered by him and so on so forth right so this is the other aspect of uh, your work right now if you look at it you know there are hardly any overlaps it in it and designers typically engage ourselves in the later the second half of the kind of work that you describe right not the mm-hmm. earlier one which is mostly you know under the control and uh, remains largely with you know computer scientists technologists electronic engineers hardware guys and so on and so forth right mm-hmm. so um, i mean your work is very interesting it kind of straddles it uh and yet you know it exposes and shows us the possibility of where design can go right what is your take on that now are we doing too much of the latter and not enough of the former um uh, first of all what i have discovered is that as a designer i am able to come up with dozens and dozens of ideas you know for de- i have the uh, insight of where a tool or a technology can be created you know i am able to see that uh, vividly you know uh, whereas uh, the of course engineering community has the capability to build the tool but uh, as a designer i am uh, able to conceptualize the tool very quickly and that has always uh, sort of been a driver and um, uh, and even the engineering teams have found lot of excitement because uh, uh we work on many ideas and many we start from any end i mean if, if, uh, some are uh, uh, like applications which can be uh, deployed uh, uh, in the market for various organizations and some are r and d ideas which uh, require some of the really hard technologies you know like uh, in the koshashri you know i mentioned about the sanskrit uh, dictionary project uh which we are doing uh, with the deccan college here you know so so there we are building sanskrit uh, fonts sanskrit ocr we are developing text inputting uh, mechanism for sanskrit we are also doing the uh, very interesting kind of te- text analytics analysis you know analytics they are wherein the lexicographic uh, like lexicographic elements are automatically parsed and you know we put into a structure and things like that so the uh, the the prime mover here is the the idea you know the the, the conceptualization which i believe comes from the de- the designers are able to articulate far better you know and uh, but you have to keep dabbling with the technology so that you know the possibilities thank you yeah uh, dr sanjay yeah, yeah. so uh... Uh, it's a very nice presentation it's always no pleasure to listen to dr dinesh we are old friends uh, i just wanted to add something which uh, no sri sunil kumar ji said uh, i have witnessed that no in simbiosis university where in the ambedkar museum uh, has you no know, the lip sync has been done the number of visitors have increased massively yeah. and uh, i have also witnessed the dhaneshwari project in fact he gifted me one or two things on my birthdays <laughs> so I, so i definitely agree with dr dinesh that no the designer visualizes and the technologies take it forward so my compliments to the entire team and idc to produce no to give a th- such a thought provoking talk that's it thank you thank you dr sanjay yeah doctor just to mention uh, dr sanjay pohekar he he was in the bits pilani uh, at the uh, research and consult- uh, consultancy division when i was pursuing my phd and since then uh, i mean we have had a long association and and uh, <laughs> he is now with symbiosis international university managing their phd uh, research you know uh, for the entire university <laughs> so thank you sanjay yeah. wonderful thanks for joining dr sanjay uh, regram yeah, it's yours please go ahead uh, dinesh uh, congratulations on a wonderful work of a very focused of you know 1992 till 2022 of almost three decades 
uh, uh, putting such a passionate and a hard work. I just wanted to know on the repurposing side, whatever the the kind of archives you are just. I just wanted to know uh, in the context of let's say purely from the students' point of view. From for example, architecture, uh, they have a reference of Percy Brown book for uh, Indian architecture or uh, Bannister Fletcher for other Western architecture. So, is there any kind of a front end apps or anything like that? where students for their research, they can use this kind of a data. It could be product design, it could be uh, uh, architecture, it could be interior design. Or uh, my second question is, is there any kind of a private partnership you do with institution and others to develop uh, a better repurposing front end tools so that uh, it could be used in a much better way? So these are all my two concerns. It's a great work. And I'm just seeing that how it could be put for a better uh, uh, repurpose kind of stuff. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, actually, for this repurposing, uh, we we are. I mean, ideas are there, but we need uh, some kind of sponsored project so that uh, we are able to turn them into um, some kind of solution. In fact. Uh, when we set up this museums of india portal you know uh, so there you, if you see all the uh, paintings of the ngma national gallery of modern arts bangalore mumbai and delhi everything is all collections are available online you know so um, uh, uh, in fact i have been uh, propagating this idea uh, to many museums that if you gave subscription of the of your museum collections to the schools you know so and develop some uh, educational linkages you know build a courseware out of the museum data that you have you know because the yes. museums are not about the past they are about the civilization so museums have everything they, they have alloys materials textiles uh, you know the, uh, the the kitchen kitchen utensils weaponry war strategies everything that is there is all even science is a part of the museums so uh, uh, and the technology you know the uh, everything is there so why not we use whatever relevant uh, artifacts that we have why not we link them with the education so if a museum you know now in maharashtra itself we have some 50 or 60 thousand schools so just imagine if you made the subscription available for thousand rupees you have enough money available to sustain a museum you know museums are suffering from uh, you know i mean they are always short of money you know they are most mm. poorly funded organizations so for me it is a tough task to first excite the people over there you know about their own work you know and and get them involved you know so uh, so these uh, the, the repurposing thing uh, i mean the uh, the uh, agencies like ncert or uh, you know some of these educational bodies they have to help us in you know uh, creating the mechanisms wherein we can uh, provide frameworks for building uh, courseware out of it you know and then it will get repurposed you know so uh, so for while learning some of the uh, alloys and materials and some of the processes, a, a, a museum object may pop up and I, I may be taught about, uh, you know, uh, how certain things were done, uh, you know, uh, a, a few centuries ago and, how, and what we are doing now. So that will also, you know, uh, organically link uh, the knowledge that we have, you know, otherwise the present day generations, they just know what is happening today, you know, uh, they don't know the history of it, how it has evolved. So that is the problem. I think we have to uh, look for more of such kind of a front end tools where, as you say, it could be little, little, it could be monetized better so that it becomes sustainable at the same time, it repurpose better and specific to the kind of a context. I would love my uh, architecture or product design students to you know when they are doing a reference or a library study or a research work they should be able to access this with a better front end and do some research i feel so yes 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 definitely uh, in fact about uh, three years before in 2019 and uh, 103rd uh, uh, International Science Council, where Modi ji had come and inaugurated at our institute at LPU, we called uh, three Nobel laureates uh, uh, from Europe, and uh, 
almost for 100 years or whatever the things we have been using physically we just uh, you know we dumped it underground uh, uh, 100 feet below so that it will be opened uh, uh, 100 years or 50 years after uh, with a uh, 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 physical things like telephone mobile this thing whatever we have been using so far in past 50 years this we have just preserved that we just put it underground as a kind of a moment as that is still there that mm-hmm. may be opened at some time that when somebody wants to see it's a physical thing so like that as you said for uh, digital archives to repurpose if there could have been some kind of uh, better front end tools uh, it can be more sustainable as well that as vengadesh has said it could also be monetized better uh, yes. better value for it as i feel yes yeah. yes certainly it's a very good work ganesh congratulations please keep it up yeah thanks sir uh, yeah i mean that's very well summarized and that's the feeling that i can see all of us uh, have towards uh, whatever you presented uh, dinesh um very very insightful very uh, i mean exhaustive in terms of the coverage and we 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 certainly got a good understanding and uh, and what goes into a uh, mindset of uh, of of this is it we are a good example of that and uh, on behalf of all of us a big thank you to you uh, dinesh and uh, i also on wish you all the best for all the projects that you are you are going to be taking up from now on and i'm sure that uh, there is more to come and uh, we wish also your team all the best who have been with you through through this journey yes i, I must acknowledge uh, and thank cdac you know because the kind of conducive correct atmosphere that is provided by cdac you know uh, with, uh, such things could be done because working for heritage is is not a, a, a very commercially uh, viable uh, uh, you know area to work but because of cdac we could sustain for so long and and uh, we could uh, uh, at least scratch the surface you know do something about it great um so with that we have come to the end of the session and uh, i thank all of you for your time and the recording of this session will be available tomorrow and uh, of course we have subsequent uh, sessions coming the week and the week after um with this i say a big thank you to dinesh and wish you a great success in your career and also a big thank you to all of you and then say a good night and see you again next thank you thank you thank you so much thank you thank you thank you dinesh okay thank you thank, thank you very much thank you